How many of you like Disneyland? <laughs> Be honest. I, I don't know. Some people sort of like, Disneyland. Psh, I like Magic Mountain. Magic Mountain. Okay, whether, you, whether Disneyland is your favorite ride amusement park, you, there, you cannot deny the magic that is Disneyland, right? You just can't. I mean, even if you think you're too cool for it, it's Disneyland, right? And I remember as a kid, um, and I, I actually kind of still get like this, but uh, it, as, as a kid, you remember when your parents told you, hey, we're going to go to Disneyland, right? And I would just be like, <sighs> and they're like, it's okay. And I'm like, Disneyland, yeah! And I'd run around, I'd be like, ah! and, I, and they would always tell me on like a Monday, hey, Jeff, on Saturday, we're going to Disneyland. It's like, that's like seven days away. And I'm really bad at math because really it's only five days away, but I don't get And so I would just be so excited. Disneyland on Saturday. And all week long, I would be telling my friends, I'm going to Disneyland on Saturday. And in my room, I would sit there and I'd be like, oh yeah. First, I'm going to go on the train that goes around the park, and then I'm going to go on Dumbo, and then I am going to go, oh, I'm not allowed to go on the, the frog ride because there's the devil in that ride, and then I'm going to go on the carousel, and then I'm going to go, and I would plan it all out, and it was, I, I mean, by the time Saturday rolled around, I'm like up at like four o'clock in the morning, Mom, Dad, it's time for Disneyland, and they're like, it doesn't open until 1030, I'm like, no. So, I'd be so excited, and then we get in the car. Now, miles don't really mean much to a kid who doesn't drive, right? Like, do you know how many miles it is from here to your house? Specifically? Probably, oh, well, you live, it's like, exactly 0.4 miles. Like, I picked the wrong person, right? Most of the time, until you start driving, you don't really understand miles and, and things like that. And so, as a kid, I would always judge how far something was based on the number of freeways it took to get there. Grammy and Pop, zero freeways. It was awesome. So, if, I, if we were going to Grammy and Pops, I knew we'd be there really quick. And then we'd um, go to, uh, oh, let's say, the mall, okay? The mall, when I was a kid, because it was out here in Montclair, one freeway. It's like, okay, one freeway, that's not too bad, it's not gonna take us too long. Disneyland, three freeways. I'm like, oh my gosh, we have to go on three freeways. And the whole time I'm like, Dad, what freeway are we on? We're still on the first freeway, Jeff. All right, when are we gonna get on the second freeway? About 10 miles. How many freeways is that? I didn't, and so we'd get on the freeway and we'd go, and that drive took forever. Am I right? The drive to Disneyland, it's almost like Disneyland is on wheels. And as you drive toward it, it's just rolling away from you. And you're just like, come here. I just want to go to Disneyland. So we finally, after like three days in our covered wagon, we finally <laughs> get to Disneyland. And... And, but you don't get to, like, you don't drive right up through the gates, right? What do you have to do first? First, you have to park, right? So we get into this parking structure, and we're like, back and forth, and back, and there's the guys with the orange things going like this, like they're docking a plane or something, and they're going like, and so we're driving back and forth, and finally we park. And then you got to take, like, four elevators and three escalators to get down to the ground, right? So we get down to the ground. You're still not at the front of the park. What do you have to take now? Now you get on the tram, but you don't get to just walk right on the tram. What is there before the tram? Lines. Lines. And I'm standing, and I'm just like, everybody's like, the kid's got to go to the bathroom. Just take him. And oh, it was awful, awful. So we get on the tram. We get, up, we, we get to the front area. We get off the tram, but we didn't have season passes like many of y'all do now, right? So we had to buy tickets, which meant standing where? And another line. So I'm standing there. I'm like, Dad, how long do we get? It'll probably be about 15 minutes. How many freeways is that? I, I'm just like, I, I cannot even. So finally, we get our tickets. We go over to the turnstiles. But you don't get to just walk through the turnstiles. What do you got to wait in? A line, because it's Disneyland. And so we stand in line, and I'm just like, <laughs> my parents are like, come back over here. Climb down off of that tree elephant. Come here. And so... 
we finally, we walk through the turnstiles. And it's almost like the heavens opened up. <laughs> I can hear the angels. Lord, Disney. Jesus and Walt. We walk in and walking down Main Street, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I want a corn dog. It's like nine o'clock in the morning and I want a corn dog. We're walking and finally we get in on the first ride, the best ride in Disneyland. Moments with Mr. Lincoln. You don't think that's the best ride at Disneyland? Well, let me tell you that that was, that was the ride that my dad wanted to go on. And since that's the ride at the front of the park, what do you think we went on first? I'm sitting there going, I'm sorry, Mr. President, could you just move it right along here? Finally, we get out and we go and we get on the first ride. And my, my favorite ride for the longest time was Dumbo. It's a flying elephant, people. This is amazing. This is magical. We go on Dumbo. Then we go and we get, there's the Matterhorn. I mean, you can see the Matterhorn from the freeway. There's the Matterhorn. Nobody told me about the abominable snowman in the Matterhorn. <laughs> We're like, this is fun. Ah! But whatever it is, when we finally got to Disneyland, and once I was in Disneyland, and I was going on the rides, and I was experiencing Disneyland, how much do you think I minded the car ride? How much do you think I was thinking about how miserable the car ride was? Do you think it even crossed my mind? Not even. Do you think I thought it was worth it? Absolutely. We are in Disneyland, and it's finally just like this... What I am experiencing now is absolutely worth whatever I had to go through. The week of waiting, the car ride in three freeways, the lines was all worth it because of what I was getting to experience now. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are, wor are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into glorious freedom of the children of of God. That's a whole lot of words. A whole lot of like, well, wait, okay, the glorious revealed decay. This is, it's saying this. The things that we're going through, the stuff that we are experiencing right now that is difficult. And one of the things I love about the Bible is the Bible doesn't downplay anything. The Bible doesn't go, look, that little, that's dumb stuff that you are experiencing now. Get over it. It's not that big a deal. Here, it's going, look, the, our present sufferings. He acknowledges that we are suffering, that life is not easy, that the stuff that we're going through, a lot of times we don't, we don't tend to know how to navigate these difficult things. And so this is an opportunity for us to find something that will walk us through our present sufferings. And it is the joy, it is the hope of knowing that we're not going to stay here. It is the joy of knowing that this is not the final destination. This is not the last, the, the best that we can hope for, which a lot of times, that's the mindset we get into. We figure that the stuff that, that is really hard in our lives right now, we get all worked up because we go, and this is as good as it's going to get. And here he's going, look, our present sufferings, yes, the things that we're going through that are hard, the frustration with parents and siblings and school and bullies and self-esteem and our bodies and everything, all of these things that are hard, that are difficult compared to the life that God has promised 
those who would put their faith in Jesus, it's going to be much better. In fact, it can't even be compared. And it's very much like what I was talking about with Disneyland. Now, thank goodness the ultimate life for us at the end of this life isn't Disneyland. It's like, oh, congratulations, the end of life, you get to live in the Matterhorn, right? You, it can't even be compared, but it is that kind of illustration of just going, you know what, yeah, we did suffer. Yeah, there is our difficult things that in the moment, when I was riding in that car, do you think I was excited? <laughs> just like, I'm going to die. We're just going to keep driving until finally we just, the end of the earth. <laughs> And we're never going to, they're just teasing me. And that's the other aspect of this, that sometimes we get into this idea that life after death is just sort of a tease. But here, this is a promise from God saying, look, the things that are to come, the life that we are going to receive can't even compare to the difficult things that we're facing right now. And it says, the creation waits in eager expectations for the sons of God to be revealed. Creation was subjected to frustration. It's going, look, everything around us is messed up. It's not the way God designed it. And we look at the, fr the, the sufferings of life, and one of the big sufferings of life that, that we consider, and we just go, man, is this it? Is like death. Have you ever asked that question? Like, why did somebody have to die? Maybe it was your grandma. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was a mom or a dad or an aunt or an uncle. And you just go, why did they have to die? Why, was it, why would it be God's will that they die? And this speaks to that. It isn't God's will for them to die. God didn't design us to die. God didn't design people in his image to have to die. That was a result of people deciding to do their own thing. And as sin entered the world, that meant that our bodies became just a mess. And there is sickness. There is disease. There are accidents. There are murders. There are things that, that were never part of God's design. And part of the reason it hurts so bad is not just, I mean, part of it is the relationship we had with a person. And it's painful to lose that relationship. But another really big part of it is that we weren't supposed to die. That wasn't the way it was supposed to go. And so therefore we suffer and we go through these things because we're in frustration because we're waiting to be set free. We're waiting for God's design to take effect again, where we can live for eternity with him. And God, we need to know this, as, as it's saying, look, the present sufferings don't even compare. And you know what, you guys? I don't even care about your sufferings. That's that dumb stuff you're going through, just get over it. What's the big deal? God is not rejoicing in our sufferings. And as a kid, I remember looking at my dad as he's driving the car. You know? So our car was going like this down the freeway because this is how my dad drives. <laughs> okay? We're driving down the road, and I was sure that my dad just didn't even care about it. Yeah, you're suffering, whatever. Uh, who cares? Uh, be quiet in the back seat. You know, don't make me pull this car over. And I'm like, no, pull over. It'll take longer. Okay, and he's driving, and I was sure that he just didn't even care. Well, now I'm a dad. And my three kids have had the same reactions to going to Disneyland that I did. My kids have the same questions that I did. How long is it going to take to get there? Oh, about 45 minutes. How many? How many freeways is that? It's like, well, it's actually only two freeways now because of the 210. So it's like, my kids have it better off than I did. But, and as I'm driving and I hear him excited and I hear him like, just like, when are we going to be there? Are we almost there? I'm not, oh, 
You dumb kids. <laughs> you just, just get over it. You know, when are we going to be there? You know, that's not my attitude. Here's my attitude. Oh, guys, I know. I know it feels like it's taking a long time. But what do I know that they don't know? Huh? How many? When we're going to get there. I know that. And I know that eventually we're going to get to Disneyland. And I know that once we get into the park, all of their cares and all of the worry and all of the frustration that they are going through is going to go away. I know that. So therefore, I can say to them, hey guys, don't worry, we're going to be there soon. It doesn't feel soon to them. It's not soon enough. But I know how long it's going to be until they're there. And so I can tell them, look, your present sufferings aren't even worth comparing with the glory that you're about to experience. He doesn't rejoice in the sufferings. He's not just telling us to get over it. And there is a hope that believers in Jesus have that can bring peace through the suffering. And that's the main thing that I want you guys to hear here today. It's not that the sufferings get any easier. It's not that you don't have any more suffering if you just love Jesus, just you know, love God and all your problems just go right away. But when you are filled with the Spirit of God, when you are given that hope of something in the future, suddenly all that suffering, there's still the suffering. There's still the hard times. There's still the difficulties. But there is that understanding and that realization of, you know what? There is a future. And there, I am not alone in this suffering. See, if at some point, and some of my kids were better at this than others, some of them would just believe me. Carter was one where I would say, hey, we're going to be there soon. And he was totally content just to believe me. It's like, oh, okay. Okay. And he wouldn't, he didn't feel the need to ask. Nathan? <laughs> like, there's a street sign. Are we there yet? There's a street sign. Was that our exit? There's a street sign. You know, he just, he needs to know. Nathan has a much harder time in the car than Carter does. Am I right? He has a, because everything's just like, I will not believe it. Right? But if we will put our faith in the God who knows where the destination is. Then when we go through the suffering, it doesn't mean we're not sad. It doesn't mean things aren't hard. It means that we are able to put our trust in one who knows. And we can have a peace and we can have a hope. The Bible describes it as a peace that goes beyond our understanding. And some of you, as you hear me say that, you're going, I want that. I need that kind of peace. And a question that I'd have for you is, have you been asking for that kind of peace? Because God is here. God does love you. God does care about you. And God will speak to you. But have you been in a place where you're just going, why aren't we there yet? Why aren't we there yet? I hate this. I don't want this. This is not fair. I don't. And, and you're so busy just trying to figure out what's going on that you haven't given God the opportunity to allow his Holy Spirit to give you peace, to give you hope, and to reassure you that there will be something that is worthwhile. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the, pain, the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, for this hope for in this hope we were saved, but that, sorry, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait patiently for it. Again, lots of words of just this, again, assuring us that, look, the whole of creation, the earth, the weather, all of the things that God created are groaning 
like childbirth. I don't know if you've ever seen a woman give birth, but it's not pleasant. They're screaming and yelling and why is this happening? And sometimes the woman's yelling too. It's not always just the husband. <laughs> the world, all of creation is going, this is not the way it's supposed to be. We are ready for God. We are ready for God's plan. And we have the Holy Spirit that can give us the hope. We have the Holy Spirit that can give us the assurance that there is something more. And this next portion talks about sort of that Holy Spirit's role. And you may be going, well, how does this work? Okay, so the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us. Yeah. So God created everything. And then Jesus came down to demonstrate God's love for us so that we could have a relationship with him. So God puts skin on, comes down to earth, sacrifices himself, gives himself, and defeats death, raises from the grave, so now we can have relationship with God. And then Jesus said, look, I'm leaving because I can only be with as many of you as I can be with, but I want everyone who puts their faith in me to be able to have their encounter with God and have life with God. And so I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit lives in those who put their faith in Jesus. And he says that he will be our counselor. He will be our defender. He'll be our guide. He's with us. He will speak to us. He will lead us. He will encourage us. So how does this work? Have, have you ever been so angry? I guess you could be excited too, but so frustrated where you just didn't have words, right? Where you're just like, and I hit, and oh my God. Right? You ever, raise your hand if you've ever had a moment like that. Okay, good, I'm not alone. My friend Josh in high school, he was mowing his front yard. His dad bought a brand new black Camaro. I mean, this thing, super sport. I mean, this thing was, whoo. Usually, this car was in the garage. Garage door down, lasers, guns pointed at the driveway. Totally protected. But this day, the dad pulled into the driveway and he went into the house and he was in there for a little bit and Josh is out mowing the lawn. He gets down here, here's the driveway and the car is parked in the driveway. So he's like, oh, I gotta be careful. And he goes like this and something caught his eye and he looked over and the handle of the mower he just went a scratch about that long all the way through the paint on this brand new black car. That was his dad's baby. So Josh goes in the house. Hey dad, um, it's not a big deal or anything, but uh, I was mowing the lawn. You know, like you asked me to, and by the way, I'm doing a fantastic job. I think I should get a raise, but that's the side, beside the point. Okay, so I was mowing the lawn, and you know, I was going back and forth like this, and his dad's like, Josh, <laughs> move the story on a little bit. Okay, so I was pulling the mower up to your car, which should have been in the, dry, in the garage, protected and safe, so this really isn't my fault anyway. And I went to turn the mower. The dad didn't even let him finish. He just goes sprinting out to the front yard. <laughs> and Josh is like, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> Follows him out there. The dad's out there looking, and he can tell by his dad's back the kind of emotion that's going on. He walks up behind his dad, and he's like, Daddy? <laughs> like this. And his dad's just like, run away. Just run away. 
And he's like, no, but dad, I'm sorry. He's like, serious, serious, just run away. Just get out of here. Just like, <laughs> so Josh came to my house. <laughs> like, my dad told me to run away. <laughs> like, Josh, I don't think he meant like run away. I think he meant like get away from him. <laughs> oh, so, so you think I should go home? No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but you... In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, for the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that, can, that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. In these moments when we are suffering, in these moments where we are scared out of our mind, we do not have to try and formulate the perfect words. We do not have to try and pray the right prayer. We don't have to go and recite the right Bible verses. We don't, we don't have to say anything. The Holy Spirit inside of us, who knows our hearts, intercedes for us, prays for us, is at work in us. And to me, that is huge because for everything else, if my wife gives me a gift, I've got to try and figure out how to react. If I want, if somebody comes and tells me something that I'm frustrated at, I have to figure out how to respond. When things go really bad in life and we just don't have the response. The Holy Spirit is one that we can rely on, that we go to and we just go, I, 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 and he knows. That's good news, right? That is, man, I'm glad God's not a far away God. Man, I'm glad that God is not so dependent on rituals that I've got to go and I've got to do nine Hail Marys and I've got to go sit in front of a fat Buddha statue and I have to go to the temple and I have to sacrifice a goat and I have to do all these. I am so glad that God doesn't need me to go through all these things, that God has given me the Holy Spirit that just is in me. He knows me. He knows my struggle. And he hears my prayers even when I can't say them. Do you interact with God like that? Is that something that you are asking God to do in you? That you are allowing God to do in you? Say, Holy Spirit, just be at work. Change me. Move in me, empower me, heal me, give me peace, give me hope, whatever it is. Are you that dependent on the Holy Spirit? Or do you limit it to, man, I hope Jeff or Carlo talks about this at youth group because I don't know what to do. I will always disappoint you. Carlo will sometimes disappoint you. The Holy Spirit is there with you. He's in your room as you're bawling your eyes out. He is with you when you're just out running and just, you're just angry and you're frustrated. When you're out skateboarding, when you're playing sports, he's with you. And he wants to have that interaction with you. And we know, and we know that in all things, God works for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Can I just say this? This is not supposed to be used as some magic verse. The way that many Christians do. Yeah, my mom has cancer. Oh, you know what? Don't worry. God works everything out together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. My mom died of cancer. Yeah, but you know what? God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So that should make it all right, right? That should just fix it, right? That's not the reason that he puts this in here. Paul does not tell the believers in Rome, look, all the stuff that, you, that breaks your heart, all the stuff that hurts and you're frustrated at, hey, don't worry about it. God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So therefore, you shouldn't have any pain. No. 
Paul tells us this. Paul gives us this assurance from God as a reminder that there is greater good that's coming than just surviving the situation. See, if this was just to make you feel better, it's like, all right, so now I feel better. That's it? All I'm supposed to do is feel better? This verse goes much farther than that. It goes much deeper than that saying, look, not, not that you're supposed to just get over it and nothing, but that there is greater hope than even just feeling better. There is greater hope than even getting what we're praying for. That God's good is greater than our situation getting better. And keeping in mind that as we're walking through this situation, as we're walking through the hurt and the pain, God is there. He cares about it. He doesn't expect you just to get over it. He expects you to turn to him and allow his Holy Spirit to work. To allow him to move in you. And that's hard. Because, I mean, God revealed to us that my thoughts are not your thoughts and neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Guess what? We're not going to have all the answers. The question of why, we're never going to get it. Because God's design is something that we'll get glimpses of and he'll reveal pieces of it to us. But we are not intended to see the whole picture. I am not supposed to pull the car over, draw out a detailed map for my kids of exactly how we're going to get to Disneyland and make sure that I include all the potholes, all the stop signs, all the stoplights, the little reflectors in the road, which off-ramp and whether the off-ramp turns right or turns left, which parking space at Disneyland we're going to get, which tram car we're going to ride on, how many people are going to be in line ahead of us at the ticket booth, which turnstile we're going to go through, whether or not the turnstile is going to smack you in the back of the head because you're not tall enough to walk through it yet. We're not supposed to know. And yet there can still be the trust of going, I believe you're good. I don't get it, and I wish that some things could be different, but I can still believe that you're good. I can still believe that you have a plan, and that that plan is good. So, the rest of this passage, okay, we've got one more week in this series. Life or death. See, when we choose to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, when we choose to trust that there is a plan, and even though we, we don't know the whole plan and we wish that things would go differently and we're, we're suffering and all these things, life, the choice of life, means that we trust in a God who created us, who loves us, and who has given us his Holy Spirit to walk through us to walk in us through, through our life. The choice of death is, I'm going to ask why. And unless I get an answer to everything that I ask, and unless I agree with every answer, and unless God does everything that I want him to do, well, then I am going to fight, and I am going to complain, and I am going to reject what he tries to do in me. Life or death. Life is hard. It is full of suffering and struggle. But we're not alone. And there is one driving the car who knows what it'll take to get there. Death, same journey, but it's all up to you. And if you choose to reject Jesus... If you choose death, then what you're experiencing right now is as good as it's going to get. What you experience in your life is as good as it's going to get. Which is why so many people are running around panicked. Do you see that? If you believe that this is your one shot, 
oh my gosh, you can't afford to have a bad day. If you believe that there is hope, if you believe there's a future, if you believe that there's a God who loves you and is going to work in you even through the hard stuff, man, the bad days are a whole lot more tolerable. So would you bow your heads with me? And I want to give you a moment to go before God. And maybe that's a new thing for you. Maybe you're here today and you're like, this whole God thing, I'm still trying to figure this out. And that's good. I'm glad that you're here and I'm glad you're trying to figure it out. And I'm glad you're, you have questions and you're confused. And if you want to talk, we can talk for sure. Or maybe you're here and you've got the church thing down. You're pretty good at calling yourself a Christian and you're, you love God. But you've sort of been living your life and been living in the mindset that this is all you've got. And you better just make the most of it because there's nothing better. And I believe that God wants to reveal more to you. I believe the Holy Spirit right now wants to work in your heart and wants to bring healing and wants to bring hope to you. So Father God, I pray over every person in this room. Lord, you know where they're at. You know their struggle. You know those who have been choosing death and have been demanding answers and been demanding to know exactly what's going on. And God, I pray that you would reveal to them this morning just your presence. That they would know that you are here in greater ways than they've ever experienced before. God, I pray for those who have been going through the motions, who, who do love you and who have put their faith in you, but God, when it comes to the suffering, when it comes to the hard things in life, they've just been trying to do their best. And God, I pray that you would demonstrate a power like they've never seen before. God, that there would be an understanding and a trust in you to guide their lives that would give them the hope and the peace and the joy that they've been longing for. So God, do, we need you to do that in a very real way. And we are here and we're waiting for you. But more than that, help us to go out into our lives and really allow you to show yourself day by day, situation by situation, and live that out in us.